we should be all right <clears throat> how does the audio sound let me know uh as in like is it too loud my voice is it too loud or anything too too intense for any of y'all You know, let me keep putting on the campfire sound for a little bit longer. But yeah, this marks se uh, session six of Read and Draw by the book Ashes. Your voice is burnt. Oh my God, Francis. <laughs> I don't trust that. Oh my God. All right. So yeah, I'm just waiting until 10 minutes in before I start reading to allow people some chance, uh, some, uh, a chance to get in here. So while we're waiting, I'm gonna once again ask y'all how you are. And I guess while I'm waiting, I could also give anyone who's pulling up that has no idea what this is a summary about what we're doing. So Read and Draw is a session that I have with people on Saturdays usually where we will read a book and every once in a while when we get to a point of a very like immersive, a very detailed, a very aesthetically pleasing scenes or dramatic or immersive scenes, we will draw them out here on my computer. But for the most part, I'll read to y'all and we will just immerse together enjoy the time mm -hmm. and once again for anyone who has not been here before I will read the summary but if you're also interested in listening to the previous sessions I have them in a collection uh, that you guys can find on my channel take your time Francis so the summary goes like this for anyone new Alex, a resourceful 17-year-old running from her incurable brain tumor. Tom, who has left the war in Afghanistan. And Ellie, an angry 8-year-old, join forces after an electric magnetic pulse sweeps through the sky and kills most of the world's population, turning some of those who remain into zombies and giving others superhuman senses. And that's like a general summary. And at first, um, maybe some of y'all might be like, what the fuck is that? Like, that sounds lame, this, that, and third, yada, yada, yada. But surprisingly, uh, I realized that the author is really good at writing, but not writing summaries. This book is very interesting. And those of you who might be new here, I totally recommend you guys checking this book out or checking out the collection playlist that we've already done of the previous sessions to get immersed into it. No, and also no, you're not gonna be able to hear it in this crisp audio because this is the first session where I have this audio, this mic now. So just letting y'all know, it's now been 10 minutes. So I'm gonna start getting ready to read and yeah. I'm gonna roll up my sleeves, but gotta cover my elbows. My elbows are cold. Okay, so, ooh, last time we left off, it was at chapter 25. I'm pretty sure that was not my goal part to stop at. This don't even sound right to my brain. So, <laughs> wait, actually, yeah, this does not sound right. I think my thing... Yeah, wait a minute. Huh? Oh, no. I lost my chapter. My fucking bookmark must have slipped out. And then someone just shoved it back in. Wow, okay. Well, gotta find where I was at. <laughs> I do know that I was supposed to be somewhere... I was supposed to reach 41, so let's see where I went.
Maybe I'm more in the middle. Did I reach this point? Let me see. Damn, that's crazy. Okay, no, I'm not over there. Hell no. That's way too deep yet. Uh. Do, 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 do. Yep, yep. I remember that part. Yep, yep. Poor Tom. Yeah, okay, so we were actually on chapter 38. There we go. Mm hmm. We were so close to getting finished, too. All right, so we are on chapter 38. So, because we are on chapter 38, we need to read about 10 chapters. So, our goal to stop at is chapter 48. Yeah. Oh, that looks ugly. Let's make that a little bit nicer looking. <laughs> uh, it's because I have this tablet really far away right now. To give myself some space. Chapter 48. There we go. <sighs> Comes in with milk and several boxes of sugary cereal. I'm crying, Grizzly. Hi. <laughs> I'm assuming you've caught yourself up on this series. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah, but yeah, all right, we're about to start. <laughs> also, hi, Grizzly. <clears throat> I hope I'm not too close to the mic, because <laughs> I'm about to lean over. Okay. <clears throat> no mistake, the wolves were behind her. That she didn't need to see them to know what they were free- What? They were free- what? English? Sorry. I'm going to be stumbling in the beginning. Because every time I go back into reading, my brain's like, LOL, what's the language? All right. <laughs> uh, all right. No mistake. The wolves were behind her. That she didn't need to see them to know what they were freaked her out even more. She didn't know how many might be there. But their scent was indescribable. Not like dog at all. Some primitive part of her brain set off a complete, total body alarm that dried her mouth and made her muscles seize. Her heart was a fist pounding the wall of her chest. The puppy sensed them now, too. She, f oh yeah, I, I should probably explain what happened last time. It's been a few weeks, so I'm, I'm actually gonna refresh y'all before we continue. So, l since last time we were here, Ellie, and the dog got taken away by three rednecks and the rednecks shot Tom. Tom has a horrible injury, is bleeding out and practically dying. And Alex did her best to heal his wound or cut, at least remove any possibility of infection and just hoping that he just won't bleed out and die. And after a scursion with three zombie kids, um, she decided, you know what, I need to go find help. So she had no choice but to leave Tom at their little base that they kind of set up camp with, which was basically no real base. She kind of just wrapped them up in... Um, I forgot what she wrapped them up in. It was, it was just sad. She just wrapped them up with whatever was in the store, the store that they were hiding in. And she just said, All right, I'll promise I'll be back. So she's on her own in the woods. And she Ellie's gone. The dog's gone. Tom might be dead by the time she comes back. And on her way down the road to go to the nearby encampment that they heard about called Rule, she's already seeing like, oh no, we might be fucked, where she's like seeing, first of all, the first reactions of when the apocalypse hit, and then she's seeing fresher bodies on the ground that are not from the apocalypse of other travelers, other survivors who were purposely killed for their things. 
there were a lot of them were shot in the back of their heads and she doesn't know what the hell is going on in this bridge but she's just or highway i think it is so she's just gonna keep going keep on keep on trucking uh eventually she comes to one of the cars where uh she sees these two dead people and one of them actually had like puppy stuff on them and she realized when she looked under one of the cars there was a a a little puppy that I guess was previously owned by the dead couple who was there the puppy obviously wasn't going to go anywhere didn't know what, what to do so she decided to coax the puppy out feed it some beef jerky and um um pick it up and warm it up but after she did that because she was distracted trying to like, you know, coax the puppy out and, you know, take care of it and this, that, and third, whatever. She didn't notice that wolves sneaked up on her. So now, right now in chapter 38, we are coming across wolves and she needs to <laughs> figure out what she about to do because she about to be food. So that's, that's what's happening right now. As you could tell by the whole, it's them and everything, you know? So that, that's where we are right now. <clears throat> the puppy sensed them too she felt it go rigid and the puppy was hunkering down and shivering all over trying to make itself very very small she kept her left hand under the puppy but let her right drift to her hip her fingers curled around the butt of her father's glock then she pivoted slowly carefully to face them there were three she didn't know anything about wolves other than what every hiker knew you didn't want to run into them despite the fact that wolves were supposed to be as freaked out by people as people were by them she heard wolves off and on throughout her time in the wakama back when things were normal their plaintive cries were eerily soothing. Of course, that was then, and this was the end of the world. These, wo- these wolves were big and charcoal gray, like something out of National Geographic, and clustered on a small rise at the edge of the woods. Perhaps a hundred feet away, the alpha male, she knew it by its smell, which was more acrid and quite strong was very tall with rangy legs, a broad chest, and golden yellow eyes. Alien eyes for an alien world. It wouldn't have surprised her at all if that rogue moon had risen. A stationary target at this distance was no problem, but wolves were very fast. She could never outrun them, and if they charged, she would probably empty her magazine and not hit one. She left the Glock in its holster, Instead, she held her right hand, palm out, hoping that the wolves would know empty when they saw it. Locking eyes with any animal was a very bad idea, but the alpha male's gold eyes grabbed hers, and she couldn't look away. The wolves stared. She remembered to breathe. The alpha male moved first. It settled into its hunches and then sank to its belly, like a dog settling down for a nap and began to pant. The sense she got was that the wolf was not necessarily comfortable, but it was ready to wait until something changed. As if by silent command, the other two sank down as well. The smallest squirmed on its belly to lick the alpha's jaw. The alpha's scent, all their scents, had changed too. Still wolf, but now mingled with something a little less sour. Another one of those weird flashbulb moments flared in her mind. Mina, lying by the fire, pressing against her thigh. This was not exactly the same, but the scent was calmer somehow, like... Friend? The tense spring of her guts uncoiled just a smidge. Well, perhaps not friend, so much as no threat. I'm leaving, she said. Maybe she should say something else. She couldn't think of anything else. What did you say to a wolf? She eased back a single step and waited. 
The alpha male was a sphinx. She took another small sliding step back, felt the heel of her boot butt against the dead woman's leg, and realized she would have to turn around. She didn't want to. She didn't want to do that, but she had no choice. All the tiny hairs on her arms and neck spiked with fear, and her skin was so jumpy, she thought it might just tear itself from her bones and go screaming down the, wo down the road. Heart pounding, she turned on her eel and began to walk. Not too fast, not too slow. Every jangling nerve told her to bolt like a bunny rabbit, but she thought that would make the wolves chase her, maybe change her smell from no threat to dinner. After 30 feet, she was still alive. The wolf's scent remained unchanged. No one was storming after her, and she decided to chance it. She craned her neck, she, tr she craned her head over her shoulder for her to look back. The wolves were standing now, watching her go, their breaths wreathing them in smoke. After a moment, the smallest wolf turned and glided back into the wolf, into the woods. A second later, the third followed, leaving the alpha alone on the rise. For reasons she didn't understand, she stopped and turned to face him. She was too far away to make out its face, but she felt its eyes. Nothing wordless passed between them, no deeper understanding, no telepathic paranormal stuff. But when the alpha male reared onto its back legs like a playful shepherd before, pivot, before pivoting and melting back into the forest, when that happened, she thought maybe there'd have been yet another change in her. <laughs> a weird interaction with rabid wolves. Yay. She's starting to figure out, mm, maybe there's a lot of different shit going on with my body. I got a message that said, hi, Timothy. Nigga, who the fuck is Timothy? What? Timothy is the character in here, but that's about it. Oh, wait, no. I think his name is Tom. Yeah, never mind. That's not him. I don't know who Timothy is. I have no idea. But hi, Adon. Welcome. We are at the session of Read and Draw. So far, I just read the first chapter. Twitch called me Timothy. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <coughs> oh, shit. <coughs> mm -mm 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 -mm. All right. I'm going to go on to the next chapter, all right? She just had a weird wolf moment. By mid-afternoon, when a sign told her she was 20 miles from rule, she'd noticed three things. The closer she got to the village the fewer dead bodies she saw. She had yet to run into anyone who wasn't dead, and she smelled smoke. The smoke was very strange and very familiar, and it made her heart thump a little harder. She smelled this kind of smoke before. Only then it had been a phantom, the first sign of the monster in her head. God, no, not now. Don't let me die here, please. Just a little longer. Get me through to the rule, to rule so they can save Tom, and then, if I've got to die, the puppy sneezed, paused at its nose, then sneezed again. Her relief was like splashing into a pool on a very hot day. If the puppy could smell the smoke, she wasn't hallucinating. This wasn't a symptom. It was real. She got a good sniffle, trying to sort out the components. Wood char mixed with a chemical sting, like the fluid her father used to spritz over charcoal briquettes, and something almost sweet and juicy like the pork roast her mother made her mother made on Sundays. But there was something sooty and unsettling about the odor, nothing that made her mouth water. Shielding her eyes against the sun's glare, she aimed a squint at the sky. Twitch used a hard R on me. I'm weak, Solar, get out. 
Shielding her eyes against the sun's glare, she aimed to squint at the sky. At first, she saw nothing, just an impression of white from the sun burning her retinas. Oh, wait, my chest. Okay. <sighs> okay. But then she spotted just the faintest wispy tail. A thin dreadlock of very dark smoke. Not leaves, she knew, which burned white or gray, and not wood. A chemical fire? Dropping her gaze to the snow, she eyed the by now familiar scuff of boots and shoes and flip flops and bare feet, and then spotted deep, straight cuts and the stamps of horses' hooves, wagons. Interesting. North, up by Oren, was Amish country, with its, with its proximities to the mine. She didn't think rule was, but maybe even the Amish had decided to come south, or, of course, they'd come out. What in the world? Oh, that's my computer, okay. Of course, they'd come out with wagons to gather up all the bodies. The people in rule must have decided to establish some kind of perimeter. That made perfect sense. No one would want heaps of rotting corpses piled outside of town. But why no people on the road? Where was everyone? Hiding? Waiting until dark? Hoping to avoid those brain-zapped kids? No, that didn't make sense. All her run-ins with those kids had been either in the early morning or at dusk. Come to think of it, she had never seen one in broad daylight. Something Larry said popped into her head. In some ways, she's still kind of a typical teenager, like always waking up just when I'm ready to sleep. Well, that was interesting. Before the monster, when her parents were still alive, she'd been the same way. Staying awake in morning classes was an act of will. Everyone her age was chronically sleep deprived, downing Red Bulls and Mountain Dews and coffee to stay alert. The monster had taken that away. When she really stopped to think, smelling that phantom smoke hadn't been the first monster sign, but the second. The first sign had been the change in her sleeping patterns. Frequent awakenings in the middle of the night, bizarre and fractured dreams, a feeling of restlessness as if she'd drunk two pots of coffee. The monster in her head had made her very different from her friends. Maybe very different from other kids her age before stealing her sense of smell and eating her memories. It had taken her sleep. And of course, there'd been her parents and that reoccurring nightmare, a trauma she relived over and over that blasted her sleep. And Tom hadn't slept much either. When he did, he always seemed to pop awake just a few hours later. And he kept that up all night. From bio, she knew most people slipped into REM sleep, dream sleep. A couple hours after falling asleep, and normal people went through three or four REM cycles every night. Other than that, other than that one night before he'd come close to telling her what weighed on him so much, Tom never slept for long stretches. Maybe because he couldn't help it. Maybe Afghanistan had changed Tom, and altered his brain somehow. She thought again of post-traumatic stress and nightmares that stormed in technicolor across the black screen of Tom's mind. Horrors from the past Tom could not outrun. Horrors. Nightmares. That might have saved him. Messed up hormones might not be the only things that had saved her from changing so far. Maybe as with Tom, altered sleep and nightmares were, were important too. More to the point, maybe it was her whole screwed up brain. Maybe the monster had saved her life. Chapter 40. At dusk, she caught their scent, faded and musty. Most old people smelled like used underwear, and she could tell from the rich clog of odors that there were a lot of them, all bunched together. She was downwind, and she thought they were still fairly distant, but she sensed their exhaustion and the sharp sting of their panic. That made sense. These old people must know what the brain zap kid... They must, these, these old people must know that the brain-sapped kids woke up just as it got dark, 
and they'd want to be off the road and somewhere safe. She could envision the road ahead, a solid whip of humanity stretching from rule for miles. She felt a prick of anxiety. It was one thing to find rule. It was another to try battling her way through a crush of fellow refugees to get help from one person, even if he was young. And how would these old people react to her? Judging from the frowsy reek, there were also dogs. And, she closed her eyes, concentrated, caught the aroma of sunshine and warm hay. Horses. Something more, too. She inhaled again, and then her nose twitched with the bite of gun oil and singed metal. Guns. A lot of those, too. When she first picked up the puppy, She'd taken the Glock from its holster and slipped it into the right-hand pocket of her jacket. She debated simply taking out the weapon, more as a deterrent than because she wanted to pick a fight, then thought better of it. If someone, started if, so if someone started shooting, it would be over fast, and there was only one of her, so she left the gun where it was. On her right, a small green sign flashed out in the darkness. Rule 6 Beyond, there was another billboard for the hospice, and a sign urging visitors to stop in at Harvest Church. Trust in the healing hand of God. A few more hours, Tom, she thought. Hang on, just a few more. Two hours later, she heard them, a muted, confused gabble. Then she spotted the yellow bob of flashlights and silver-edged silhouettes. Not a throng, but easily several hundred bathed in, bathed in the sickly green light of the surreal moon. She smelled them much better now, a great stinking ball of old men and women at the end of their tethers, and not a few dogs. People and animals were streaming and bunching around her, but either they hadn't noticed her in the dark or didn't care. The puppy was awake too, and she could feel it begin to shiver with fear. It's okay, she murmured, hugging it close praying that it wouldn't start to bark. The last thing she needed was attention. She'd already done up her hair in a long braid and shoved it beneath her watch cap, but she felt she still felt exposed. One good look at her face, and those oldsters would know she was a teenager. She jammed on a John Deere ball cap she found on the road, pulling the bill as far down as she could. She turned up the collar on her coat too, hoping that would mask her silhouette. No one was moving forward. That was the thing. Instead, the crowd milled uncertainly before a huge 18-wheeler ly 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 what? lying on its side like a beached orca. The forest hugged the road on either side, but no one made a move toward the woods to go around the roadblock. And then she saw why. Among the trees, ranging on either side of the overturned semi, and perched on top of the truck were other people and many, many dogs. She heard a hollow clop coming from behind the trailer, the jingle of traces, and knew she'd been right about horses. Far ahead, one of the men on the ro at the roadblock was shouting into an old-fashioned bullhorn. We will get to everyone. We know you're tired, but you'll just have to wait your turn. You'll be safe here. The changed don't come this way. So everyone just calm down. The changed. So that's what people are calling them now? How could they be sure those brain zap kids wouldn't come? She slowed, hanging back, teetering on the very edge of the crowd, trying to decide what she should do. She was afraid to slip into the woods, and those guys in the truck had rifles. Duck and weave through the crowd? Man, that was a big risk. If she bumped anyone, if someone got a good look. Just ahead, a trio. One man, two women, bunched with a Labrador tagging behind. Its tail drooped, and it smelled of dog and salt. Another smell that made her flash to a bowl of slimy cold oatmeal. Her aunt tried to make her eat the day after the helicopter exploded. Sad, she thought. The dog sad. But then the, ear the lab's ears pricked. She scented its sudden surprise at the pop of an electrical outlet, a burnt fizz sizzling in the air. And then it was pivoting, 
straining at the end of its leash, its tail whisking back and forth, and it started to bark at her. This dog snitched. <laughs> dog snitched at her. <laughs> it said, wait a minute. <laughs> wait. I smell a teenager. I smell this teenager right here. <laughs> you want to play? And it's like, wait, shut up, dog. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're outing me. <laughs> Basically, if you guys can't already tell, she's fucked. <laughs> the moment these old people find out she's in this crowd, they're gonna kill her. They don't know if she's changed or the that and third. They're just gonna shoot her. Shoot, ask questions later. And they're all gonna shoot a lot. They're not gonna be able to ask her no questions. She'll be dead. <sighs> all right. Chapter 41. Shut up, she thought. Her knees began to shake, and she felt her legs go rubbery as the dog continued to bark. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Watson, a gangly elderly man in a fur-trimmed parka, sounded both exasperated and exhausted. Come on, what are you... He turned, his flashlight scything through the dark, cutting across her body before continuing on. As soon as the light passed, she ducked, tried turning away, but then the torch swept back like the beam of a lighthouse and caught her. She heard him gasp. Oh, Jesus. What? said one of the women. Alex thought her scent was very sour. The combination of days without, without washing and, annoying, and annoyance rolling off and cloying fug. Turning, the woman got a good look at Alex, pinned in the light like a bug to a cardboard. Holy shit, she said. And then Alex heard the metallic thunk chunk of a shotgun pump. Wait, Alex said. The puppy was whippering now. Hugging the dog with one hand, she held up the other, palm out. I'm not one of them. Not yet you aren't, said the woman. To her left, another much older woman with a beaky nose had drawn an, a drawn an ancient looking luger. Or maybe you're just moving up the fucking evolutionary ladder. Please, Alex sidled back a step. I'm just trying to make it to... Not with us, girlie. No way. The older, hawkish woman with the luger tagged the toggle, the toggle joint and then let it snap forward. Hold up, Em, the elderly, man, the elderly man said. She seems okay. Look, she's got a dog. Let's just take a second here. Look at your dog, Alex said. The lab was still barking, but its tail whisked the air in a frantic semaphore and now she could hear more dogs beginning to bark. Beyond, heads were turning, flashlights stabbing through the dark. The pool of light around her body widened, got brighter as more and more people shone their torches her way. Your dog's not afraid, because you haven't turned yet, said the woman with the shotgun. I say we shoot her now. The beaky woman squinted down the luger's barrel. Her bony hands had tightened to claws. Get it over with. Better yet? Hang the little bitch. Wait a minute. The <laughs> oh, wait, I said that too. Because <laughs> my brain's like, wait, bitch. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> wait a minute, the man said. We need her. We have her. They'll let, us, they'll let us in. I got no use for one of them, the Luger lady spat. Remember the last time we ran across? Went to sleep a, l went to sleep a little angel, woke up an animal. But the dogs know, don't they? Alex said. The lab, Watson, was straining at its leashes and beyond. Alex could hear other dogs whining in a general murmur rippling down the line as more and more people became aware of her presence. There was the sound of handguns being drawn and the rack of rifle bolts and shotgun pumps. <clears throat> Isn't that why you have them? She's right, the man said. We, don't have, we didn't have Watson then. It's just a damn dog, Luger lady said. What the hell does it know? Did it know that little bitch that got my Cody? I told him to kill her. But she was just a kid. Just a sweet little in innocent monster killer. Hell, you don't want her. I'll take her. This from another man dressed in hunter's camouflage. He held what looked like a stubby machine gun. Maybe an Uzi in one. In one hand and two ammunition belts crisscrossed his chest. He had very white very square teeth that were too perfect and probably false, but his grin was wide and maniacal and menacing. 
I'd like to see one of them try to come after me. I'd just dare them to try. No one's taking me, Alex said, working to keep up her voice steady. But her heart was trying to punch its way from her chest. The puppy had gone silent and was trying to melt into her body. She saw Uzi pushing past the others. And she took a step back, then another, please, I just want to... Hey, wait a minute, another voice, very angry, coming from the crowd. Who says she's yours? I said she's mine. Uzi clamped a beefy hand around her left wrist, just as someone else, she couldn't see who, grabbed at her from the right. She felt the puppy clawing at her shirt, and then the dogs began to bark, not snarling or foaming, but in a prancing, jabbering frenzy. Then it seemed that these were not people anymore, but plucking, grasping hands and angry mouths and shattered, ancient faces. Mm. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Uh, but shattered and angry fa ancient faces full of desperation and hatred and despair. They weren't really seeing her at all, only what she represented, the cause of the disaster, a symptom and the disease itself. The puppy was crying, trying to squirm its way out of her, po out of her jacket. Careful, she pleaded. Please stop. You're going to hurt him. Stop. Calm down from the front of the crowd. And far away, the man with the bullhorn was shouting, What's the trouble here? Everyone, calm down, just stay calm. The ripping roar of bullets, a stattering flash of light, split the night. I'm telling you, back off. Uzi brandished his weapon. Just back the fu- Another shot, this time from behind, and Uzi jerked. A look of stupid surprise on his face. Then he was falling in a rattling heap. Hi, Crystal. Looks good. We're just doing another read and draw session. Time to get comfy and hang out with us. Get her, someone shouted. And then they were running, the crowd boiling around, pushing her back and forth in a tug of war. Hands tore at her clothes, tangled in her hair. Her jacket burst open and the puppy was suddenly gone in the crush. Although she heard it yelping, the man with the bullhorn was shouting and there were more shots. And then she screamed as fingers stripped off her coat. Someone saying, she's got a gun, she's got a gun. A chaos of dogs thrashed and twisted on their leashes. The clamor of their barking and, yap and yapping redoubling in the general roar. And now the people were shouting, kill her, get her, get. Quite suddenly, she was airborne. Her feet swept away from under her. She screamed again as the night sky and the sinister moon spun in a drunken whirl. They were passing her from hand to hand like a crowd in a, in a gigantic mosh pit. She couldn't see where they were taking her, what they meant to do, but then she was pinned to the ground, staring up as if from the bottom of a very deep well. Little bitch! The old woman with the lug lugger darted one gnarly claw fist at her face. Shrieking, Alex wrenched her right foot free and kicked, feeling the solid thump all the way to her knee. And the moment the woman's beaky nose crumpled, flailing, the old woman staggered back as the great spume of blood gushed down her face. Alex kicked again, but more hands caught her, and then she felt her head being pulled back and the skin of her neck exposed. She thought, oh God, they're going to cut. Instead of a knife, she felt the rough bite of a rope. Her scream choked off, and then they were dragging her by the neck over the cold, hard earth. This was like the nightmare at the gas station all over again, but there were so many of them and she had no chance. Still, she fought, twisting, digging in with her heels. She clawed at the rope, felt her fingernails tear as she scrabbled for a handhold. But then they were hoisting her up, hands catching at her to keep her from falling, and her hair choked off as the nape tightened. The woman whose nose she'd broken, Luger Lady, was back. Her mouth hung wide open in a bloody, ravenous snarl, and this time, she clutched a knife. Gonna cut your little head off, Luger Lady shrilled. She exhaled a cloud that reeked of iron and rage. Gonna cut your little... The sudden crackle of gunfire was crisp and sharp and glassy. Then a voice, very clear, cut through the din and a thundering roar of blood in her ears. Go, Jet, go! Someone screamed as a German shepherd bulleted out of the crowd. The shepherd was black as coal and very large. And as Luger Lady half-turned, the dog sprang. Luger Lady had time to get her hands up, but then the dog barreled into the old woman. She tumbled to the ground, 
her knife flashing away. And then the old woman was shrieking, was shrieking. Get it off me, get it off me. Hi, Manny. Yeah, some dark shit's happening here. Our main character was about to get hanged. <laughs> These niggas said, hang her, hang the bitch. <laughs> How are you? Welcome to Read and Draw, where we read this dark ass shit. <laughs> this is part six of the book Ashes, if you aren't, if you aren't, if you haven't already known. We usually read these on Saturdays, but I took a little bit of a break from it. Also, I need to turn on my other light because the, the natural light is starting to wane. Oh, oh my knees. <laughs> Yeah, this is that, that, that dark shit, Minnie. Is this your first time being here? I'm going to continue reading, but let me know if this is your first time being here, alright? If so, I'll try to give you a rundown after I finish this chapter. <laughs> Jesus Christ, someone said. I've been here before, but never paid close attention to, to the story. Oh, damn, Minnie. <laughs> well, if you're ever interested in checking it out, like I said, we do have a collection for it, so you can go back and read the previous stories. Listen to the previous sessions. Ah, my ear. <clears throat> ah, my ear. Okay. Don't shoot it, a man shouted. It's one of theirs. Don't shoot it. Around her neck, the bite of the rope suddenly eased, and then Alex was on her knees. Her chest was on fire, and her throat felt as if someone taken a razor blade to it and slashed. Gasping, she hung on all fours, trying not to be sick. Luger Lady was still screaming, but no one moved to help her. And incredibly, no one tried to shoot the dog. Alex couldn't really see what was happening, but she heard the voice again. Closer now. Jet! Off, boy! Off! And she had a single, stunned thought. That voice. He's not old. The shepherd instantly obeyed, dancing away from the old woman but it did not leave. Instead, the dog turned toward Alex, its black lips curling back, and Alex waited, helpless for the jaws to snap at her flesh, tear her skin. Instead, the dog nosed her, a single playful nudge. The scent that came from the animal was like a splash of cool water on a hot day. She thought of the morning Mina had broken out of the underbrush to save them from the wild dogs, the intense relief that had melted the icy sludge of fear in her veins. She remembered how, all of a sudden, Mina had been reluctant to leave her to follow after Ellie. She thought of the wolf. No threat. All around, dogs bristled and snarled, but not at her. They were growling at their owners. The voices in the crowd fell instantly, deathly silent. And people let go of the dogs. Surging forward, the animals ranged around Alex in a tight, protective circle. Some licked her face, others nosed at her so she, so, as she dragged the rope from her neck. The big black shepherd pressing against her as if daring someone to cross it. And then something very small spurred from the crowd and into her lap. It was the puppy, wiggling all over, so frantic with relief that it tried to climb on top of her head. Good boy, Alex said, still stupid with amazement. And then looked up as the crowd wavered and broke. She saw old men with rifles and shotguns parting the crowd like Moses at the Red Sea, wading into the dogs. Looking up, Jet let out a soft whine, his black tail whisking the air in greeting. Following the dog's gaze, Alex pulled in a sudden, a sudden startled gasp. Are you all right? He knelt on one knee and reached a hand to steady her. His eyes was, was as jet black as his dog's. His cheekbones were high and sharp as axe heads, and his scent was a complex mix of the darkness itself, cold mist and black shadows. With a little yelp, the puppy jumped to look at his hand, and the boy smiled. Hey, you, he said, ruffling the dog's ear. That's a good pup. 
So, <laughs> that's uh, one of their first times meeting another young person in a while. <sighs> they haven't met a young person that was not brain zapped um, since they met each other. So, ever since um, Alex, Tom, and Ellie were together, they never met any other kids that were not brain zapped before that. So this is the first kid or teenager who who they who Alex has met now during this apocalypse that was okay. So that shocked her. And apparently, as they say, he was also hot. So <laughs> she was met, she was very zapped. <laughs> she said, damn, you cute. <laughs> oh my god. I, I don't even know how to like draw this because this was about this was like a lot of moments of like confusion and panic for people. And even I wasn't 100% sure what was happening. All I know is that they were about to hang her. It just seems a little too sexual. So, <laughs> terrifying and sexual. So, we're not gonna draw that. <laughs> Cause people were grabbing at her and shit. There was a rope around her neck. Like what, what, what is happening here? That lust shut out for a second. She is a thirsty girl, bro. Thirsty. I mean, it makes sense. She's also like a a virgin teenager who was also who also couldn't really spend time hanging out with other t fellow teenagers. And now all the hot guys are pulling up on her, and she's like, <laughs> and like, damn, girl. <laughs> She said, damn, he cute. He kind of he kinda cute. <laughs> That's what's going on with her. Mm -mm -mm -mm. All right. So let's continue. Whew. Uh, I should try and get more water, but... I feel like getting more coffee. You know what? I think that's what I'm gonna do. Give me a sec. I'm gonna grab some more coffee. Cause I'm gonna need my throat to not die. We got like, what, how, how many more chapters? We got like mm, seven more chapters to go or some shit? Mm, no, six. Yeah, six more chapters to go. So give me a second. Y'all can have the campfire music while I Go grab another cup of coffee. Cup of Joe.
with a new cup of coffee. Draw real quick. Uh, I'm almost done. It's got six more chapters to go. Uh, hopefully, I don't have any. Uh, I probably have some possibly drawing to do in between those. These usually last about three, four hours. But yeah, let me know after I'm done with this if you have time. If you're streaming, then we could do the call after or something. That coffee good. All right, I'm gonna I'm mute this so I could sip this real quick. <laughs> Enough of that slurping. Woo. All right, let's get back into it. <clears throat> so, chapter 42. The dark-eyed boy's name was Chris Prentice, but his friend Peter was in charge of men who were with few exceptions, old enough to be grandparents. I don't care about the damn dogs. We don't know that it's not a trap. Peter didn't look much older than Tom and had a tumble of wheat brown hair that fell to his muscular shoulders. She could be luring us, man. I'm not, she said. They'd marched her back under guard behind the semi and she now sat cross-legged in a waggy. Uh, in a wagon, what? Waggy? They'd taken her pack, and one of them might have her Glock, but she wasn't sure. The puppy curled in her lap, its ears lifting anxiously as Chris and Peter argued. When they'd nudged her into the wagon, the shepherd had sprung up after her to lie quietly by her side, as Mina had done. Aren't the dogs supposed to know? Peter's face flashed with annoyance. Could be early yet. You still might change. Anyway, the dogs won't know if you're telling the truth about this other guy. We go out there, you've got an ambush set up, and there go a wagon, horses, weapon. I think the risk is worth it, Chris said. He was the quiet one, the observer, and Alex thought he was about her age, maybe a year older. We need someone like him. He's a soldier, he knows bombs, you're always saying, I know what I'm always saying, fuming. Peter planted his hands on his hips. Okay, but we wait until morning. That's too long, she said. Peter fired a warning glance. I don't think I'm asking you, but if you want to march on out of here, fine by me. Peter, said Chris in his calm, patient way, you know we can't let her leave. Alex wasn't sure she liked the sound of that. On the other hand, she wasn't particularly anxious to face that mob again. Look, she said to Peter, 
I've been out there all day. We're not talking zombie hordes. I'm sorry, but you don't know what you're talking about, said Chris. His tone didn't change, but she heard the rebuke. You're lucky to be alive. Three attacked you, and you said one had a club. That's new. Even though they didn't coordinate their attack, they never really hunted together before either. He looked at Peter. Could be one first step toward them getting organized. All the more reason to get Tom now, she said. If he isn't dead yet, Peter said. You keep saying that. He will be. You keep saying that he will be. Is that what you want? Peter scowled. Of course not. I'm not an asshole. I'm just saying that you're really lucky. If you'd been caught farther out from town when it got dark, you might not be sitting here. In case they hadn't noticed, a bunch of old people had nearly lynched her. So she hadn't exactly been safe close to town either. Is that why you got the roadblocks? To keep out those brain-zapped kids? Brain-zapped, Peter, par Peter barked a humorous laugh. I like that. We call them the changed, but yeah, the perimeter is one, one of the reasons they're not walking down Main Street. But a perimeter couldn't be the only reason, Alex figured. Short of building a fence, how did you secure an entire village? What sucks, Peter continued, is that they figured out how to survive. They know how to get warm. They know to find shelter. They follow people. From what you said, it sounds like they're learning how to really hunt. So maybe they'll kill each other, Alex said. Peter shook his head. They don't, which completely blows. Right now, they're not organized enough to overrun the town. They might get there, though, and then we're screwed. There are, there are way more of them than we got bullets for. She was giving up on Tom. You have all these people. You've got guns. With the horses, you could get to Tom in a couple of hours. If one of you were hurt, you'd go after him, wouldn't you? I'm not doing hypotheticals, said Peter. Look, I understand you care about this guy. I get that. He sounds like he was a pretty good guy. He is, she said, her eyes filling. He is. Peter, Chris said quietly. I say we go after him. It's not like there's a lot of us. If we don't fight for each other, who will? If he's spared, then it's worth the risk. Alex heard the emphasis fair, spared, like changed. These people didn't see Tom or her or even themselves as survivors. They were spared, like people who'd escaped some sort of wrath of God thing. Damn it, said Peter. He scuffed snow with the heel of his boot, and Alex smelled the peppery edge of his resistance ease. All right, but you stay behind, Chris. Oh, let me... Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Alice didn't like the sound of that either not because Chris was such an ally but because Peter already didn't like her so if there was a, if, so if there was a little accident Chris apparently felt the same way I don't think that's a good idea yeah 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 that's just it you're not thinking Peter snapped but I am and I do not want to explain to the Rev or the council why the hell you're dead and I'm not a splinter of ice stabbed the dark mist of Chris's scent. No hint of anger crossed his face. There was nothing to, there was nothing to betray except his scent. Chris may have been an, only a little older than Alex, but he was very calm. A lot like Tom in some ways. And Alex thought she understood why Chris's scent was so... What was the word? Dark. Not evil, but shadowy. As if Chris knew how to hide. Maybe he dealt with people about to go nuclear his, lo his whole life. My grandfather's not here, Chris said evenly. The Council of Five is not here. It's just us, Peter. And the deal is we watch each other's back, so I'm coming. The two stared at each other a long moment. Then Peter gave a curt nod. Fine. If we're lucky, we can be there a couple hours before dawn. Now excuse me while I go sell the others on this crazy scheme. After he stomped off, she said to Chris, thank you. You're welcome, he said, but he did not smile. His scent thickened, folding him in darkness again. But I didn't do it for you. And if Peter told you to put a bullet in my head, I don't think you want to go there. He said, damn. 
They were eight altogether. Two men, two men on horseback, flanked each other on the, flanked either side of the wagon. Fuck my brain. Peter rode point, and another man brought up the rear. Chris handled the wagon, and Alex sat between him and the jet. The puppy curled in a knot in her lap. What brain? Hello. Nice pup, Chris said. What? Everything was so loud. The creak of the wagon, the jangle of traces, the heavy clops of horse hooves. After days of skulking around, hiding in the woods, nearly jumping out of her skin every time a branch cracked, she was a little freaked out by the noise. Your pup. Don't see too many Waymies around here. Waymies? Waymaraners. I don't know how to say that. What the fuck? He's going to be one big dog when he grows up. If I'm not wrong, he's going to be a ghost, too. At her confused look, one corner of, her ma of his mouth lifted in a half grin. You don't know much about dogs, do you? Other than that, they suddenly like me? Never had one. It's the color of his coat. They call those kind of waymies gray ghosts. He got a name? I haven't had time. She looked down at the dog. I like ghosts. Good a name as any. You'll have to let our vet give him the once over before we can let you keep him though. You've got a vet? Yeah, and we could use a couple more. We've got a lot of livestock and of course all the dogs. We get a lot of people headed this way, so a vet will eventually come through. She remembered the argument about Tom. We need him. That what you were doing back at the roadblock? Weeding people out? Uh-huh. You don't sound sorry about it. Even in that queer moonlight, Chris's eyes and hair were as dark as his scent. It's necessary. How can you turn people away? We do what we have to do. We don't have unlimited supplies. Whether you get to stay depends on what you bring to the table. That's pretty harsh. Yeah, it is. But there's only so much food to go around. And we have to balance who we bring in and what we need. Right now, we need people for labor, tending to the animals and general upkeep. We need guys to man the perimeter. Come spring, there will be fields to till and plant. So we might let in more, if people are still coming, that is. Who decides? Peter? No, the council of five. Like, she frowned, a town council? He shook his head. More like, you know, elders. She almost laughed. Nearly everyone's an elder. Except for us, yeah. But these guys have family ties that go way, way back. The Reverend's family, the Yeagers, pretty much started rule from the ground up. And a Yeager's always been the head of the council. As I understand it, the Council of Five has been in charge of rule for a long time. Something dig something dinged. Peter said the Reverend is your grandfather, but your last name is Prentice. That's right. Growing up, I never saw my grandfather. So you didn't live here before? She sensed a sudden weariness, a reserve that reeked of secrets and shame. His scent got even darker. No, I'm from Merton, about 60 miles southeast. You? Evanston, Illinois, a couple blocks from Northwestern. A flicker of something like amusement. I just applied to Northwestern. Wasn't my first choice. Okay, so he was a senior, either 17 or more likely 18. What was? Doesn't really matter now, does it? Ouch. She felt the barrier slam down and decided there was no answer to that. Instead, she watched a knot of clouds scud over the face of the alien moon. Snuffling, the puppy burrowed deeper into her lap. Chris said, sorry, it's just that I don't like looking back. No point. It's all dead anyway. How do you know that? We scrounged up an old radio, the kind that still works. Her pulse skipped. Harlan and Brett had taken the ranger radio where they'd stolen the truck. Where did you find it? Maybe he f heard something in her tone because he flicked a curious glance. Farm about 10 miles out of town. Oh, she worked at keeping the disappointment out of her voice. Have you heard a lot of broadcasts? Not tons, even less as time's gone even less as time's gone on. Enough to know it's a mess out there. He paused. Where were you when it happened? She gave him the bare minimum. The mountain, Jack, Ellie. She didn't ask why she was in the walk he didn't ask why she was in the Wakama or about her parents, and she saw no reason to volunteer the information. What about you? she asked. 
school. I was outside. I was at. I was outside, helping the chemistry teacher set off a smoke bomb for the sophomores. She just dropped. I thought at first she fainted, but she was gone. What did you do? Before or after the plane crashed in the football field? After. I nearly beat a kid to death with a textbook. It was either that or he was going to take my face off. There was this other girl in the group. She was still okay, not changed. Only she freaked out and took off for the playground, where there were all these kids. Most of them hadn't changed. Some had, though, and they were going after the others. Oh my god. She didn't, she didn't even want to imagine that. Then these five football jocks spotted her, plowed right into that playground and tore the girl apart. Ugh. Apart. And after that, they started in on the little ones. He paused again. I still see it sometimes when I close my eyes. Hear it. The whole freaking mess. What did you do? Not what I thought I would, he said. I ran. They rode in silence for a while. Then she asked, how did you end up in rule? Because of your grandfather? He shook his head. My car wouldn't start. Home was 25 miles away, and Merton's a big town. After what I saw at the school, I figured it would be 500 times better worse there. I mean, what? I figured it would be 500 times worse there. Damn, my brain. All those people dead or getting killed or going crazy? No point. But it was still home. There was just me and my dad. The shadows in his in Chris's scent thickened and Alex thought that his father was someone Chris didn't like thinking about. Now that we understand more how old the people who dropped how old the people who dropped were, I know there wouldn't be any point. He was 50. Oh, hold on. Okay. But you couldn't have known that then, and there have to be exceptions. Look at us. We only prove the rule. As near as we, we only prove the rule. As near as we can tell, the majority of normal people walking around are either really young or pushing 65 or 70 on up. Oh, she cast about for something to say. Well, your father would want you to save yourself. He wouldn't want you dead. The corner of his mouth lifted again. You didn't know my dad. She didn't know what to say to that either. How many of us are there? In rule? Well, we got about 500 people total. Out of those, 63 are spared. 63 kids out of 500 people? That's right. Only 25 kids are our age. 12 guys, 13 girls. He measured her with a look. 14 now. Only 25? Uh-huh. Peter's the oldest spared. He's 24. He hesitated. He's actually a pretty good guy once you get to know him. She'd reserve judgment on that. How does anyone know we won't change? Maybe it's a matter of time, like Peter said. She thought about Deidre. Have any of the younger kids changed since the zap? Never quite gotten, never quite gone that far. She didn't understand. What do you mean? I mean, we don't let things go get that far. In the moonlight, his face was nothing more than a glimmer. Why do you think we have the dogs? An early warning system, she realized. Like canaries in a mine. The dogs must sense the change before it happened. Still, she couldn't believe it. You decide about a kid on the basis of what a dog thinks? They haven't been wrong yet. Meaning these people had experience. My god, had they locked the kids up and watched them change? Like an experience experiment just to be to just to make sure? They must have, or else they wouldn't have such faith in the dogs. A wave of unreality washed over her, leaving her shaky and ill. The dog's fingers, the dog's finger kids, and then these people, what did they do? Kick the kids out of town? Kill them? She thought back to those three kids, the girl with her club and those two boys. Until that moment she had dwelled on them much, she'd been too busy trying to keep Tom alive, and then fending off a mob. Then there was no point to borrow a phrase. What she'd done had been self-defense. She had no choice. We do what we have to do in order to survive, Chris said quietly. When you've been here a while, you'll understand. 
the hell of it was. In a way, she she already did. The bodies of the three kids still laying where they'd fallen, where she killed them in the parking lot of the convenience store, which begged an un another interesting question. Why weren't the changed lunched? What? Why weren't the changed lunch for the run of the mill scavengers? Scavengers had clearly visited. Ned was still dead, but headless now. And something else had wandered away from Ned's left hand. But the change hadn't been touched. And someone else had been there. The back of the convenience store had been forced from the, in from the outside. In the office, there was a pile of car mats and the reek of bourbon and infection and nothing more. Tom was gone. R.I.P. Tom. Oh no, Tom is dead. Ah, no. Tom is gone. Oh my God, Tom is gone. Tom is gone. Oh my God, Tom is gone. So Tom's missing. <laughs> That's all I can say to that. That's all I can say. Tom's gone. Part four, rule. So now we are more than halfway into the story at this point. And she has lost everyone that she started her adventure with, or I guess her journey with. Ellie was taken and so was Mina, the dog. Tom was taken. There's nothing of him left in the, like there's, there's no traces of where he'd gone. Someone took him. So now Alex is on her own. Let me see. The pop of distant gunfire jolted Alex from yet another fitful night's sleep. She registered the slash of morning sun in an already too bright and very cold room. Hold on. I'm gonna pause this real quick. We're on chapter 45. Um... Where is my little oh? There's the bookmark. <sighs> All right. So what 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 does some of y'all think of this, huh? What do y'all think? After everything that's happened. So far in this story, how do y'all feel about this story? Let me sip some more coffee before I go back in. Reminds me of a story about kids in the zombie apocalypse and that you had to be under 13 not to transform into a monster. Had to be under 13 not to transform into a monster. That's crazy. Yeah, I actually remember there was like a, the uh, artist did like a whole role play group for that. But them hoes were bougie as fuck about it, surprisingly, so it, it wasn't fun. Let me see. But yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it seems like there's certain things that are required for you to not be turned. So it seems like kids who had gone through trauma from what we're seeing are the ones that are being spared from being turned. 
during the time of the apocalypse. So any kids who never had any trauma in their life, when they've gone through the phases of puberty, they were struck with this change in their hormones and they became feral. But but that that's about it. Like it seems like Ellie will be fine because her her mom abandoned her as a baby and her dad died in the war and she saw her grandpa die. So she'll be fine when she grows up, when she hits puberty. I don't think she will be affected. I would be fine then. Oh, damn it. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, whatever you've gone through through life, you'd be fine in the apocalypse. Uh, the only thing you'd have to worry about is old people who wouldn't fuck with you and, you know, surviving. So as long as you could do those two things and also not get eaten by other brain-zapped kids, then you, you would be all right in this world. You'd still have your brain. Well, until someone breaks it open and eats it. Uh, yeah, and then a Alex, her parents died and she got cancer. So that also saved her. Tom is obviously a man from fucking war. He came, he was over at Afghanistan and shit. Like, homeboy saw a lot of drama. He, he'll be all right. He saw a lot of drama. Although it goes to say, it makes me wonder what position his friend had in the, in the in the army because it seems like his friend didn't have a lot of trauma or maybe not enough. I don't know. Because his friend was supposed to be also like a war guy, but I think he might have had a position where it was like he wasn't in the line of fire and shit like that. So who knows? It'd be interesting for him to explain that if, if it's in the other books. Uh, and we already know, obviously, Chris ha has some trauma, even before this all, all broke down, like, Chris gone through some shit, Peter's gone through some shit, so that seems to be a reoccurring theme with these kids. So once puberty hits you, like, if you aren't, if you weren't already hit with the thing at the day of the apocalypse, once puberty hits you and you have no traumas, you will turn. But if you are a fully developing adult, you, you should be fine. Another thing is, the trauma won't help you if you're too old either. If you're too old, you're just going to die. Like if you are around your 30s and up between 50 and 30, uh, you was probably going to die either way. You were going to be killed immediately in the beginning of the apocalypse. And yeah. And that sucks for Alex, you know. They really thought they could make it. They were like, yeah, we got this. We can do it. And then, you know, they lost Ellie and the dog. And she lost Tom. And now she's stuck in a low-key cultish village who wants to keep her around so she can have babies with these niggas. She, she, she hasn't included that in yet, but, like, that's obviously what's about to happen to her. So yeah, we are on chapter what? 45, which means six, seven, eight. We got three more chapters to go. I might not even um, draw anything this session, to be honest. Who knows? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Chapter 45. Ooh, my, 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 my mouth was wet for a little bit. What the fuck? All right. Chapter 45. The pop of distant gunfire jolted Alex from yet another fitful night's sleep. She registered the slash of morning sun in an already too bright and very, ro very cold room. The soft bed and the comforting Oh, so normal aromas of sausage and eggs and fried potatoes and, yes, coffee. Yet what she felt was not hunger or gratitude, 
or horrible sinking sensation. Like when you go to sleep hoping the world will change, only to wake up and find that it hasn't. Yes, she was safe and warm and fed and clean for the first time since leaving the ranger station. But Tom was gone and she had failed. More shots, not many, after three days, almost Thanksgiving now. She was getting used to the gunfire, which was sometimes more, sometimes less. She pulled the pillow over her head to blot out the noise and light. She had nothing to be thankful for. She had failed. Tom would never have failed her. She should have never left him. God, this was so unfair. First her parents, then the monster and her life, and school and friends, then Hannah, then Ellie, and Mina, and now Tom. She had to get out of here. She had to find Tom, and then Ellie, too. Gather supplies. She could get a pack, a map, a gun, but then what? There was a quick rap on the door. More a formality than anything else. Ugh. Hell no. Let me check this working. La 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 la. Yeah. Uh, the the knob turned, and Jess poked her head into the room. I thought I heard you moving around. She said, "Time for you to come downstairs." Matt's here to take you to meet the Reverend. Why? Three days and her body still felt like one big bruise. Her back ached, her throat was raw, and her hands were a quilt of healing cuts and scrapes. It's not like it changes anything. Now, none of that self-pity, girl. Just had the look of a spin- Oh, God, why is my voice dead? Oh, <coughs> hello? Uh. Now, none of that self-pity, girl. Just had the look of a spinster librarian. Dry and efficient, with steel gray hair pinned in a bun. All she needed was a pencil behind one ear and cat's eye glasses on a to keep a chain. Corith Cor Cor oh God, Corinthians say, God is faithful with the temptation, and He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Yeah, yeah. It means stop feeling sorry for yourself. God is testing you. How do you figure that? Alex said, feeling very sorry for herself. How do you think? Jess counted off on her fingers. Let me see. You survive the attack. You don't change. You rescue a child. You nearly get eaten by wild dogs. You nearly get eaten by the changed, and you're almost lynched. Oh, and the dogs like you. Did I miss, did I miss something? Yeah, I failed the one person who would have died rather than hurt me. I don't see how those are tests. They just happen. Then you are very blind, and it's high time you woke up. You're not the only one with problems. Every single person here in Rule has lost someone they cared about, and some of us more than one. I watched my girls drop dead in front of my eyes, but I thank God my grandson was spared. Our lives are a ruin, but you don't see us all dragging around with long faces, feeling sorry for ourselves. Everyone works, and that includes you, young lady. Now get your little butt out of bed before I go drag it out. You're not my mother, Alex said, and then thought, oh boy, did that sound like Ellie or what? And thank our Lord for that, Jess retorted. I am not a bully, Alex, but neither you, nor I, nor, El nor anyone else here has time for a pity party. There's a puppy downstairs going crazy because he wants to see you, and there's work to be done. I don't have to listen to you. Under my roof, you do. When Alex didn't reply, Jess lowered herself to the bed with a sigh. Look, I don't enjoy this. I'd much rather we just get along. Alex thought that was probably true, but Jess was hard to read, as straightforward as she appeared to be. Her scent was, well, what Alex imagined. White smelled like. Not mist. Nothing shadowy like Chris. Jess's scent was, was a blink. You can start by leaving me alone, Alex said. I can't do that. I know this sounds trite, but if Tom meant this much to you, 
then he wouldn't want to see you like this. He sounds like he was a very fine man, a very brave young man, and he saw something in you worth saving, not once, but several times over. You can try telling yourself that it was a reflex, that he would have done it for anyone, but he didn't have a choice. But remember one thing in the end, dear. He chose you over his friend. He chose you. Jess brushed a hank of hair from Alec's forehead. Scripture says, by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. What does that mean? She asked miserably. It means you must honor Tom's sacrifice. You must honor him. He would want you to live. Living feels like a punishment. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Everyone I care about is gone. As long as you're alive, there is hope, Jess said. Hope is saying that I will live on. I will live on one. I will live one more day. And that is a blessing too. What's that from? The book of Jess, she said. Now get up. Don't make Tom suffering all for nothing. In the kitchen, Jess was puttering over a skillet as Alex's housemates, a plump, cherry 16-year-old named Tori, and Lena, an arrogant-looking brunette, Alex's age, washed and dried. Ooh. A much older man, weather-beaten and craggy as a cowboy, slouched, slouched at a white, farm-style kitchen table. Chewing, he looked up from a mug of coffee and half-eaten muffin, then swallowed and said, Well, good morning, sunshine. How'd you sleep? Fine. Thank you, Doc, Alex said. Kincaid had, done, had told her the very first day that it was either Matt or Doc. Alex just couldn't wrap her head around being on a first-name basis with a guy pushing 75. After her icy room, the kitchen, warmed by an old-fashioned cast-iron stove and filled with the intoxicating aromas of cinnamon, nutmeg, and apples, was a relief. Alex's mouth watered and her stomach growled. The kitchen side door opened and ghosts crowded in. Spying Alex, the puppy let out a happy yap, scampered over, and in general made a fuss. Grinning, Alex bent to give the squirming puppy a tummy rug. How you doing, big boy? More like fat boy, said a third girl, who come in with the dog. Sarah was tiny, with very dark eyes, and bones as delicate as a porcelain doll. Dragging off a rose-pink knit cap, she shook off a tumble of blonde r ringlets. He practically rolled down the steps. Lena said to Alex, Yeah, now that you're done skulking, sulking, you, you can go out in the cold for a change. I don't mind walking him. Kneeling, Sarah scratched Ghost's stomach, then giggled at the puppy dissolved into helpless squiggles. Her face turned wistful. My brother had a dog. This really cute little cocker spaniel. Only, he got hit by a car. Well, since there are no cars, you won't have to worry about that anymore, Lena said. I'd love your help, Sarah, Alex said, ignoring Lena's eye roll. Alex, I made up a plate for you. Tori turned from the sink wiping her hands on a dish towel. Her cheeks were dotted with color and her, hand, and her hair had frizzed from the steam. Why don't you sit down and I'll... You know she's not a cripple. Lena dropped a dried plate on a stack with a clatter. Stop being such a suck-up. Alex pushed to her feet. It's, o it's okay, Tori. I got... I can get it. Hey, Dirtle. What up, y'all? I know it's been a minute, but I'm... But I'm back. Whispers loudy. Nigga, story time? Oh, we uh, hi turtle what's good yeah guess what we got a new bitch <laughs> remember ellie <laughs> we got a replacement for that headache now we got lena yeah <laughs> so i'm assuming you missed the most of this most of the first half of what we just read would you like a quick recap Oh, we turtle, would you like a uh, recap? Let me see. Now nah, you good, continue. I right.
<clears throat> Tori's eyebrows crinkled and her mouth formed a tiny her O. I'm not sucking up, she said to Lena. Lena snorted. Yeah, right. Just because Chris keeps hanging around doesn't mean that Peter- Lena, Jess warned. What? I'm just saying. I don't get why you're all treating her like she's any different from us. Well, Sarah began timidly. I did hear that the dogs- The dogs, the dogs, the dogs. Lena did another wildly exaggerated eye roll. They don't know any- They don't know everything. What if the animals change? Has anyone ever thought about that? It's not like the animals didn't go apeshit that first day. Thank you for that stunningly precise scientific observation, Lena, Jess said, expertly flipping an egg. When you get your degree in veterinary medicine, I'll be sure to ask your opinion. Now, the last time I looked, those dishes weren't drying themselves. Lena gave a mug a half-hearted swipe. When does she start? You, c you would never let us get away with this shit. Oh, my ears said Kincaid. Lena Christina Stultz. Jess hacked off two thick slices of brown bread. I will not tolerate abusiveness in my house. One more trashy ra- <laughs> One more trashy word out of that sewer mouth and I'll speak to the reverend. You're bluffing. Lena threw her towel aside. You won't do it. And the council won't turn me out. Because you need us. We're just so spared. We're so valuable. Lena, they just want to protect us, said Tori. Protect us? We're prisoners. They won't let us leave. But it's for our own good. Just because the adults say that doesn't make, doesn't make it true. Lena glared at Jess. You can keep me here a million years, but you'll never make me agree with you. I don't care if you agree, Jess said, calmly pouring coffee into a sil silver thermos. But let's be clear. When you are chosen, I'll kill, my surf I'll kill myself first. When you are chosen, you may do what you wish under your own roof, but so long as you remain here, you will follow the rules, or I will ask the reverend to reconsider. I don't think you want to test me on that. Jess capped the thermos. Is that understood? The kitchen had gone very quiet. Even Ghost was still. Tori looked on the verge of tears, and Sarah was milky white. Alex's eyes kept sliding from Lena's pale face to the floor, but her mind whirled. Chosen? What's that? And Lena tried to leave, but they wouldn't let her? Wait just a minute. Yes, ma'am. Lena's voice was small, but Alex could smell the hot, peppery sting of her fury. Excellent. Jess tucked the thermos under one arm and picked up the wrapped sandwich. Now, if you'll excuse me, that poor guard's waited too long enough in the cold for his breakfast. The door closed behind her with a decisive snick. No one moved for a moment. And then Sarah crossed to Lena and touched her arm. It'll be okay, she said. I miss my mom too. Lena shook her off. I don't miss that bitch, she, is, she hissed, and rushed from the room. In another moment, Alex heard her storm up the stairs. Kincaid broke the silence. Tori, I would dearly love another muffin if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> Yikes! Yikes, yikes. Sips the tea? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. They drop a lot of info on us in that one argument. Bitch, what's the chosen? Excuse me. What you mean chosen? <laughs> you choosing for what? <laughs> Bitch, I thought I was just gonna stay here. <laughs> You're choosing me for huh? <laughs> What's going on? Hello? <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Woo! Chapter 46. By the way, I am still going to do a quick recap. Alex is now in a village that is nicely protected and all that. However, as you can already sense about this new village she's living in, they got some shit that they're hiding. Not even just shit that they're hiding. They haven't fully told her everything that's happening. Like, everything that she needs to know. And need to be aware about. Because she's only been here for, like, three days so far. And she's been depressed. So they haven't really explained anything to her. <laughs> Chapter 46. Kincaid had brought a gentle, sway-backed pinto named Honey for, 
for her. But Alex balked. I've never ridden a horse, she said, ignoring the guard who lounged against the front gate, looking amused. His dog, a fawn-colored pit, capered up to Alex for a pat. Why can't we walk? Because it's faster to ride, Kincaid said. Believe me, if you end up assigned to one of the farms, you'll be happy to have a horse. Yeah, the guard do the, mm, the guard drawled. He sucked back steaming coffee. Otherwise, you'll be getting up before you go to sleep. Come on, Alex, said Kincaid. Oh my god, leave me alone! <laughs> go do that. Really? The world's not gonna fucking end if I don't do it. Hold on, I gotta do some stupid shit. Fucking aggravating. Okay, I gotta do it on my phone. Y'all can listen to this music while I do this. <laughs>
Okay. Back to the story. <clears throat> we got two more choppers left. And then after I gotta head out because I gotta do some bullshit. Chapter 46. And let me check that I that you guys can still hear me. Yep. Kincaid, yeah, there do do do. Come on, Alex said Kincaid, and leave off with that dog. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Sorry, I had gotten a text. All right, um. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm coming, said Alex, but she was grinning. Sensing that Alex's attention was wandering, the dog had rolled onto his back and was plaintively pedaling air. Alex stooped to scratch the dog's ruff as the pit bull groaned. It's not my fault. Looks like we got ourselves our own little dog whisperer, the, dog, the guard said, shaking his head. Lucy doesn't like anybody, but seeing is believing, I guess. Lucy, come on now, heal. With an almost human sigh, the pit rolled to its feet and gave Alex a reproachful look. Do something. Then, head hanging, the dog walked slowly back to the guard and settled on his hunches with an audible harumph. It took her a few tries before she could boost herself into the saddle and some more time for Kincaid to fuss with the stirrups and go over what the reins were for. How to sit, what to do. Then they headed for town, the pit woofing encouragement. That's good. You're getting the hang of it, Kincaid said. He was astride a lean. He was astride a lean leopard spotted Appaloosa. What? Couple of days and you'll be cantering with the best of them. Hmm, she was thinking. Yeah, maybe cantered right on out of here. Unfortunately, Honey seemed to have to take all of take all of life at a walk. Even so the animal's easy motion was pleasant. Every dog they plas Every dog they passed, and <laughs> fuck, hold on, give me a sec. My brain. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Every dog they passed, and they went by quite a few, let out a friendly bark and tugged at its leash, tail frantically whisking back and forth. Kincaid eyed her. Dogs always this friendly? Not with me. Uh huh. Kincaid watched a guard wrestle a chocolate lab to a sit. While you keep this up, you'll never be lonely. Jess's house was a little west of the village center, perhaps less than half a mile away. As they rode, Kincaid gave her a rough idea of Rule's layout. The village itself had always been a small, virtually closed community. A stopover between the now defunct, defunct mine and other towns that, can't, that catered to the men who worked there. After the attack, however, Rule had expanded to protect nearby assets, principally, principally forests, outlying farms, and livestock. All the major roads were barricaded at one-mile intervals, beginning five miles from town, and guarded 24 hours a day. More foot patrols with their dogs roamed the woods. The only road into the village was northwest. Anyone not allowed to stay was escorted to the southwest corner, 30 miles north of the mine. You got pretty much free reign in town, though you always, get, you, though you always gotta have an escort if you want to go anywhere outside the village center, Kincaid said. Tempers still run a bit high when it comes to the spared. We don't want anything happening to you. The way he and everyone else said spared and changed made her feel very uncomfortable. That chosen, that chosen thing too. What was that about? The whole scene felt way too religious. What's with this reverend in charge and his council of five? Maybe these people all belong to some kind of cult, like Jonestown or Wacko or something. Look at Jess, spouting Bible quotes. They seemed pretty organized, too, like they had a set of rules in place from way before. <laughs> is, that why I never, is that why I need to meet this reverend in the council so they can figure out what to do with me? Sort of. The rev's pretty hands-on, and the council runs things and decides who goes where and does what on the basis of need. Did you elect them or something? Kincaid shook his head. The five families have been running rules since the village got started. The Reverend's family, the Yeagers, are the most important. They're the richest, the first of they're the richest, the first of the five families to settle rule going on over a hundred and fifty years now. Owned the mines, built the village, started the church. The Reverend and his brother took over the mine after their father died. Mine pretty much tapped out twenty years ago. But you get men here work but you got men here worked that mine their whole lives. That kind of loyalty and sense of family carries through in times like this. The Uyghurs took care of people before, and people figured they will now. So everyone listens to Pastor Uyghur? Reverend, yeah. Let's just say he's the final arbiter. What if everyone else on the council disagrees with him? Never happened, but ha no, never happened yet. Everyone always agreed, always came around to one guy's way of thinking. That didn't sound good. They couldn't always see eye to eye, could they? What if I want to leave? Ellie's out there, and Tom, well, as I get it, you have no idea where they are, that right? No, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't be looking for them. You got some bright ideas where you should start? She bit back a snarky retort. No. Then, until you do, you might be best if you find a way to fit in here. But rule's not my home, she said. Lena's words ghosted through her mind, and she was starting to get a very bad feeling about this. You're not my family. Well, let's see what we can do about that, he said. The village center wasn't much. A large white church and rectory stood on the northwest corner. To the west was a sprawling two-story village hall with high, arched windows and a clock tower made of old-fashioned brownstone. Due south, the square was lined by an ancient five and ten, a bakery next door to a small grocery called Murphy's, Martha's Diner, breakfast 24-7. And at the end of the block, a combination Christian bookstore, coffee house. Oh my f God. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay.
Okay. I might just turn off my phone straight up, just kill it. <sighs> Alright. Combination Christian bookstore, coffee house, higher grounds, directly across the square from the coffee house was a shuttered bar, which from the looks of the vintage ads for Blatt's and Ballantine beer, festooning, festooning the brick face, hadn't done business since the dinosaurs. Guards patrolled the sidewalk in front of the grocery, five and ten, in, in coffee house. Martha's was also open, judging from the lacy scent of brewing coffee and maple syrup and pancakes. Men in camo gear hunched over tables, ranged along the steamy front window. Spying Alex, their dogs scrambled to their feet, definitely getting worse. She saw more dogs butting their noses against the dinner's plate glass, and she smelled how much rounder and more fecund their scents grew when they spotted her. Mina wasn't nearly this bad, and it's only been, what, a week? Ten days? She felt eyes on her and turned to see Kincaid studying her. She didn't know him, but she didn't sense anything bad rolling off him either. He smelled like a comfortable leather coat, something her dad might have worn, edged with a hint of something lightly floral. Powder? She said, do you know why they're doing that? I've heard that the dogs don't like people who are going to, you know, but me, but you they love. Kincaid's shoulders moved in a small shrug. Don't know yet. Let me think on it. The church's front door opened and a gaggle of children spilled out. They were all young. None were older than 10 or 11 and they tumbled over one another, racing for a playground just off the rectory. Seeing the children listening to their shrieks and laughter, hearing the joyous barks of the dogs, all this brought an unexpected crush of grief to her chest, and she had to look away. Belatedly, she realized that she'd pulled back on her reins, and now Honey stood, her breath smoking, patiently waiting for Alex to make up her mind. Kincaid had also pulled up and was watching her. When their eyes met, Kincaid said, Still gets to me. It seems so normal, she said. That's because it is. We try to make things so, as normal as we can. Yeah, right. Normal little things like gunfire and guards. She'd heard no more shots since awakening. But she wondered who they were shooting, and where, and why. We don't want them to grow up dumb, either, Kincaid said. School's one thing they all have in common. Gives them a routine. We got a guy, we got a guy used to be a... We got a guy used to be a principal over at Merton Elementary. You'll meet him when you start class tomorrow. I'm going to school? Oh yeah. Just because it's the end of the world doesn't mean you get to cut. That's so not fair. Cheer up. We got some good teachers that have come out of the retirement. Kind of ironic you think about, if you think about it. We do our time and get put out to the pasture. Now we're the ones left picking up the pieces. Put out to pasture? She opened her mouth, but then turned at the rapid clop of horse hooves. A hay, a, hay a hay wagon bounced down a snaky cut. <sighs> I jagged through the woods. This time, Peter was driving. Jet was perched on driver's seat alongside Peter, and Chris trotted behind on muscular blood bay. Instead of hay, the wagon was crammed with people, all blindfolded. More refugees who might just be valuable enough to keep, she figured. When Jet caught her scent, the black shepherd dog barked a greeting, and Chris turned spied them and lifted a hand before continuing on. She watched as the wagon rolled to a halt in front of the village hall. What's going on in there? That young lady, said Kincaid, is what you're about to find out. The village's hall main corridor was lined with offices, some open, others shut tight. Fear curdled the air. A clog of guards and morgue dogs kept watching over a long line of bedraggled elderly refugees. Alex fixed her eyes on Kincaid's back, but she heard the resentment, the, res the resentful whispers as they passed. Then one man said, quite distinctly, Leave me alone with her, and I'll show you how it's done. A burst of mean, raucous, raucous laughter. The dogs whined anxiously. Alex half expected Kincaid to say something, but he kept walking. Behind came the clatter of dishes, and Alex turned to see two women pushing a metal food cart like the kind they used in hospitals to bring patients their meals. No need for spidey senses either. Bacon was bacon. 
Someone in line groaned at the aroma. All the refugees watched, hollow-eyed, as the woman trundled up to a thick wooden door with a push bar and reinforced glass. One woman knocked, and a few seconds later, the door was open, was pushed open from the inside. Alex saw the back of yet another dark, back of the yet another garden. As the woman disappeared, she caught the thinnest finger of a scent coming from beyond the door. Not the dead meat stink. She thought she would have caught that as soon as she entered. Anyway, this was different. It was familiar. A scent she'd picked up before. Tobacco and rotted teeth and old whiskey. I know this. Who? A loud, piercing scream came from the end of the corridor, and Alex gasped. Her thoughts instantly derailed. The refugees fell silent. But the dogs in the hall began to whimper, and a few barked. The screams came again, and then two guards came. And then two guards rounded the corner, dragging a sobbing, struggling old man between them. No, no, you can't, the, the man wailed. He was very old, almost withered, with arms like twigs and a knot of twine around his waist to keep his pants from falling down. With a sudden burst of strength, the old man spurred to free the guards and scurried for an office door. At that, the dogs strained at their leashes, yapping and pawing at the air. The old man grabbed the knob and yanked, but the door was locked. A look of utter despair broke over his weathered face, and as the two guards approached, the old man began to weep. He crumpled to his knees, he gnarled fin his, gnar his gnarled fingers still wrapped around unyielding metal. You can't send me back out there. I got no one. I got nowhere to go. He pleaded as the guards tried to pull him free. The old man hung on with the grim tenacity of a leech. Tara had lent him a furious strength, and the wasted muscles of his arms went as taut as rubber bands. I can still work. I'm still good for something. Please don't. Amid a chorus of excited barks from the dogs, another guard hurried to help. Between the three, they pried the old man's hands free and then carried him. Still thrashing and screaming down that long corridor and finally, mercifully, out of sight. Jesus, said the man, who wouldn't have minded showing the others how things were done with her. He flashed Alex a hostile glare. To Kincaid, he snarled, you ought to be ashamed. He's one of us. And you're saving them. What the hell makes her so special? Well, for one, Kincaid said mildly, she knows how to keep her mouth shut. At the end of the tea corridor, they hung a right. The windows here faced south, and the hall was much brighter. There are more guards. She was starting to get used to seeing old men in camouflage with rifles. Then Kincaid told her, yeah, then Kincaid led her to a set of closed double doors on the right. A plaque to the left of the door said, Courtroom. We'll wait out here for a few minutes, said Kincaid. He dropped into a straight back chair with a little sigh. She remained standing. Her mouth was dry, but her palms were wet. Why is it so important that I see this council and the reverend? I mean, they can't decide where everyone goes. There are too many people. Five hundred, give or take, yeah. And no, they don't eyeball everyone. Wardens, men who've been given the keys do that. Keys? You mean like to unlock doors? Not physical ones, no, it's like a biblical for reference, Matthew. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Some concept as the Mormon same concept as the Mormon's priesthood, although we're not Mormons. What it boils down to is that the council awards certain men the authority to make decisions in certain areas. The farms, the armory, supplies, sanitation. For example, Peter, he's an Ernst, and they're one of the five families, so he's warden for the militia. He decides which missions get carried out, how many men will be needed, things like that. He'll see newcomers too, decide if they're suitable for guard duty or good in a fight. So the people in the hall are waiting to see the wardens, or their, representati or their representatives and lieutenants. People like Chris, yeah. Her eyebrows drew closer in her frown, but Chris is Reverend's grandson, right? So why doesn't he have a key? How come he's not warden? Kincaid's lips screwed to a rosebud. Well, he said carefully, there's the fact that Chris isn't pure rule, born and bred. He's got some of the blood blind, bloodline, but his parents weren't uh, of the village. They left and their history is a little murky. Peter is rule bred. Peter is rule bred, older, has more experience with these matters. There are other reasons, but those are as good as any. Rule bred? Bloodlines? Rules sounded a lot more closed and regimented than she had originally thought. So who does the council see? The spared. Kids like you. And the borderline cases. People who might do well here, but the wardens aren't quite sure. So they send them on to the council for final judgment. 
the council also sees people who might not be able who might do, who not who ugh, who might not be well adjusting very well she recalled Jess's threat is that what Jess meant when she said she'd asked the reverend to reconsider Kincaid bobbed his head the reverend always has the final say where it comes to the ban ban the fingers of a chill walked her spine like banishment something like that Kincaid put a hand on her shoulder look that's not your worry right now okay Best thing you could do is concentrate on putting your best foot forward and don't lie. The Reverend will know if you do. Okay, that was interesting. If you lie, do they, uh, ban you? Not as a first choice, no, but some kids can't adapt. They don't settle down. Like Lena? She's a handful, that's for sure. So why not let her leave? We're, uh, trying to hang on to the spared. Safe her all the way around. But isn't she- is- but isn't that her choice? Isn't it mine? What about free will? Free will is okay, said Kincaid. Kincaid, ugh. Only look where it got Adam. One of the courtroom doors opened, and a rickety old guy who looked to be about 190 stuck his head out. Rev will see you now. Just as I was getting comfortable, Kincaid grumbled. Then grimaced as he stood. His knees cracked. I should get these replaced when I have the chance. I should have got these replaced when I had the chance. Don't talk to me about your damn knees, said the rickety guy. He worked his jaws and Alex heard the clack of dentures. What I want to know is who who's going to get, who we going to get to fix my damn teeth. Damn. All right, last chapter, 48. The courtroom looked like something out of Judge Judy. Wood paneled and small with a three-row gallery for spectators. A rail, the bar with a swinging gate, and two rectangular tables, one to each side of the gate. A jury box was snugged along the right-hand wall. The judge's bench was front and center, and behind the bench sat five men, all in black robes, all with, st all with stolid faces, seamed by wrinkles. Two who bracketed the rest on either side, like matching bookends, were ancient, so withered a strong breeze might knock them over. She couldn't guess the age of the other three. Old was old. She knew which one was eager, though. Kincaid has said that the Reverend always sat dead center, and she studied him now. He was completely bald, with a nose like a squanched potato, and waddles hanging from his neck that wobbled when he moved, like those of a turkey vulture. His dark eyes were alive, and bird bright, and they fixed on her now with a coldly speculative look, the way a crow-eyed roadkill to decide if it was worth the effort. So you're Alexandra, Yeager's voice was surprisingly even and deep, almost booming, perfect for belting out a sermon. Come on in. Don't be shy. Just walk through the bar there. She threw a quick, furtive glance at the other four men, but they were silent and expressionless. What was their job? To observe? Ask questions? Their skin exhaled the mingled funk she'd come to associate with the old. Peppermint and paper skin. Dirty socks and old farts. And a general fusty de decrepitude. Nothing menacing at all. Yeager was different. He smelled opaque and chilly, like cloudy glass or fog. Little like Jess, she decided. A blink. She couldn't sense his intent at all, or what he felt. Well, well, Yeager peered down for the bench. From that angle, he looked more like a vulture than before. Finally, we meet. My grandsons told me about you. What had Chris said? Yes, sir. I'd like to meet all the spared. You are our future, and I want to feel that when time comes, we've chosen well. Come here. I'd like to see you eye to eye. Yeager beckoned her closer, and now Alex saw a small step stool set up before the bench. As she mounted the steps, her eyes brushed over narrow brass nameplates. One squared before each of the old men. The first two, starting from her left, read Born and Ernst. Front and center was Yeager. And then came Stein, Stein, Steink, and finally to her far right, Prig. Now she also saw something else she hadn't before, a sixth chair set off by itself, beyond Prig. There was no nameplate, nothing to indicate to whom the chair belonged. It might be simply a spare, but she didn't think so. She eyed the bench and for the first time noticed that the way the council was arranged seemed unbalanced, like there was someone missing. Six chairs but only five men and it's the Council of Five, unless it hasn't always been that way. 
Yeager extended his hands, palms up. If I may. She hesitated, flustered. Then remembered Kincaid's quip. He's very hands-on. She slid her palms onto his, her skin jumping at the contact. Yeager's hands were gnarled, the knuckles swollen, the skin dry as old parchment and spotted with age, but his grip was strong. Warm hands, said Yeager. Yes, sir. She expected him to let go then, but he didn't. She wanted to tear her hands from his grasp, but forced herself to, re to remain still. She felt the eyes of others, but didn't dare look away. One thing I would like to understand, Alex, said Eager. I'm not clear how it is that you end up in Wakamal. Tell me about that. I, um, I cut school. Really, she figured it didn't much matter now, but she decided to keep her answer short and to the point. Now that the man, now the man to her right rumbled, was that a habit of yours? Caught off guard, she cut a, cut a look his way. Stein, st fuck, why does that have to be the nigga with a difficult name? We're gonna call him Stye, his, his family name named Stye, because I don't know how to say this, this name. Stye. No, she said. Yeager said nothing, only rubbed his, horn, his horny thumbs over her palms. Stye continued. So why then? I wanted to think some things through. When Stye only stared, she added college things like that. Ah, Yeager said, the future. What you were going to do with your life. Close enough, yes. To the far left, one of the withered guys, born, piped up in a reedy quiver. What did you decide? I didn't have a chance, sir, she said. It helped that it that was true, but then, feeling the reverend's grip shift, she had a sudden flash into intuition. What had Kincaid said? Don't lie. The reverend will know if you do. And hands on. My God, was Yeager like her? She never considered that other people might have changed as she had. Larry, who'd seen more survivors than she or Tom, hadn't said anything about it. Maybe because that kind of change wasn't common. Or the people who had developed a super sense kept it secret. She had, even from Tom. Then again, she had a lot of secrets, given how paranoid everyone was now. Not telling about a super sense might be smart. So could Yeager sense whether she was telling the truth, not by smell, but through touch, like a human lie detector? How would that work? She knew people flushed when they were nervous, so there was temperature changes. A person's skin also carried an electrical charge. That was how a computer touch pad worked, by sensing the electrical gradient. That was that was why a fingertip worked but a pencil. But a pencil which carried no charge wouldn't. Yeager must have had a natural born knack to begin with. He was a pastor after all. She remembered the sign for the Harvest Church, trust in the healing hand of God. Maybe not far from the truth, Yeager might not heal, but perhaps he could feel an innate ability augmented by the zap. But why Yeager and not all the other people who'd survived, some of who were very old indeed? Why her? A penny for your thoughts, Yeager said. He smiled his vulture grin, but his grip did not change. My father always said they weren't worth that much. It was right to mention her father. It was all right to mention her father, she decided. All parents were dead, pretty much. So that made her no different from anyone else. And if she could steer the conversation, to so Yeager's immediate right, Ernst, Peter's grandfather, great grandfather, said, "What did your father do?" He was a cop. Ah, this seemed to please Brig. The other at bookend. He actually rubbed the knobbed twigs of his hands together. A man who knew good from evil. She had never heard her father refer to any of the drunks or wife beaters or scammers as evil. She said, "Yes, sir. I guess so." Well, that is also what we do here. Tell me, Yeager cocked his head. Why did those dogs favor you? Why did they recognize you? I don't know. I'm not a dog. But you must have an idea. Probably the same way I recognize them, but not Reverend Yeager of Jet or Jess. And why is that? And that is, Yeager asked. She decided to chance it. I guess the same way you're able to tell the things. She heard Ernst's sudden involuntary inhale. Yeager's vulture eyes slitted. Meaning? She guessed right. She had him, and there was just the smallest crack in his blankness. Blankness. That cloudy glass, something very wet and very metallic, an odor that reminded her of the day the dogs had nearly killed her and Ellie. Water? A river? No, that's not quite it. More like rain. Rain? She remembered the day this had all begun, and those storm clouds to the southwest and gray ashes that looked like rain. Is that why he smells like wet glass? Because he was by a window watching the rain when it happened? Meaning? Yeager repeated. She felt the intensity of the other man's gaze burning holes into her brain, but she did not allow her eyes to wander. I mean, you could tell if I'm saying it's truth because you feel it, literally through your hands. A beat. No one spoke. Yeager's eyes raked her face, then he abruptly let go of her hands. 
His gaze clicked to a point over her shoulders. Matt, wait outside a moment, will you? She'd completely forgotten Kincaid was there. Uh, Kincaid said, clearly surprised. Okay. She felt a pr quick prick of fear. Why can't he stay? She asked eager. He ignored her. Matt? Sure, I'll be right outside. Alex, it'll be okay. Yeager waited until Kincaid was gone, and then he turned his searchlight gaze onto Alex once more. Yours is in touch. Why couldn't he stay? Because there are some things better kept behind closed doors, Ernest said. Of all the others, he seemed to be the one closest to Yeager in authority. On Yeager's right hand, she realized pretty biblical. She wondered if Ernest's first name was Michael. The fewer who know, the safer for everyone, Ernest said. What is it that you sense? Yeager asked. His eyes pinned her. Is it is yours touch? No, but I can tell things like you can, such as I know what people are feeling sometimes. I know when they, they changed are around. What? Ernest said, startled. You can do that? Yeah, she said, but she kept her gaze on Yeager. How? The, the same way I know there's a murder in this building, she said, because I smell him. <laughs> Damn. 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 We're ending it there. Damn. <laughs> chapters with no breaks really oh shit oh Whew. oh my spine all right what y'all think before we close off this session what did y'all think how did y'all feel what did you think what were you feeling Kai streaming. Let me see. I think we're just gonna raid somebody. So let's see. Pretty interesting. Yeah. This book is very interesting. There's always some concerning shit happening here. I don't know why I closed that. Why did I close that? All right. Feel like I definitely should have came earlier. Crying Empire. Well, basically what you missed in the beginning was the fact that um, Alex had to leave Tom, who was injured, to go find help at the nearby t um, town that they heard was a refugee for people in the apocalypse. So at that point, you know, when she got there, she was obviously attacked when there was other people waiting in line to get inside the village, but she was thankfully saved. And one thing that she also learned was the fact that dogs now really, really like her. So that's a thing. Even wolves, they respect her. And, uh, when she got there, you know, she was able to get the help. And when they got back to the station, Tom was gone. Someone took Tom and all that was left of him was the smell of burnt flesh, infection, and just exhaustion or whatever, right? So she doesn't know where Tom is. She just assumed that he got killed. Like the, the, the zombie kids just dragged him away and ate him. So that's what she assumed. And now she's living in that cultish village. And now, you know, after settling in and her depression is starting to weed off a little bit, she went to finally talk to the man in charge who also has similar senses like her. Instead of a sense of touch, a sense of smell like she does to smell of things, he has a sense, sense of touch. So, yeah, there's that. Let me see. But yeah, what we're going to do now is we're going to go raid over to Hound because I got some shit to do. Uh, if I'm not tired later today, I will probably pop, pop back.